I mean, yeah, for a while, eh? Oh. Chapter 17? Yeah. Right? Have you guys done your summaries? <coughs> yes. I'm choose some guys for summaries. Who wants to choose themselves in the front line? And do your summary. <coughs> Take the next line. Hold back. Tato, I've got a year summary. I've got a year, I've got a year summary. And then, so now you can do your summary. We'll start with you. Ooh, okay. um, I've built an emotion for far too long now, just to put it as going in. I'll finish projects everywhere. I'm looking forward to working in wisdom. I will make my list and plan again and then consult God first and plan and see what the, the list turns into then. I'm sure now I will prosper and move forward instead of being stuck in the same place. This chapter teaches us to take responsibility head on, follow through on the task at hand, even when the excitement has passed. It is fun starting and completing something, but many a time the middle part is not so much fun and becomes tedious. This is when we need to pray and push through. Amen. Nice. Well done. Teto. Oh. So that when he asks you to show what money has blessed you with, you can show him and you can um, enlarge uh, his territory and do. Uh, what? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and do what you ask. Okay, thank you. Hold back. Uh, we need to start taking responsibility for our actions. Jesus says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, we will never have God's uh, standing, uh, privilege of standing and ministering. And uh, we'll never have His anointing if we don't take His responsibility serious. The Bible clearly says that it's God's will for us to bear fruit. Always remember that if God gives us whatever we ask Him for, there is a responsibility that goes with the blessing. Mm. Uh, it's almost the same wisdom. You're copying, you, were you copying one another? Huh? Margaret, please read yours. To be responsible is to respond to the opportunities that God has placed in front of us. Excitement can only take us so far, so that's why we never finish what we start, because of lack of excitement. People who must always have someone else pushing them will never really do anything great. Those who only do what is right when someone is looking won't get very far either. We must be motivated from within, not from without. We must live our lives before God that sees all. People with a wilderness mentality want to have everything and do nothing. If you only do what is easy, you will always remain weak. Set your mind to do what is in front of you and not to run even if it's challenging. Listen to what you're saying, eh? <laughs> okay. Obviously, this book wasn't directly written to people with addiction or dysfunctional behavior. It was written to a broader spectrum. So it does tell you that just because we are very good at what we do in a bad way, it doesn't mean that everybody else cannot benefit from this book. This book has sold, uh, I think, five or six million copies all around the world over time. And I'm telling you, it's not always an addict that's reading it. Just that it relates a lot to us, particularly this chapter. But you find, I was going over it, you find what is happening in our lives over time, especially the eyes, a lot of us are not, aren't spring chickens anymore. Eh? We, we're going into middle age, we going into, I think some of us are still younger, good, good for you, but trust me, it's not going to always be there. So utilize it. The time doesn't wait for you. The time doesn't wait for any man or woman. No one, no time waits for you. And what you find when we're in this type of behavior, we pull our families into it and they start enabling us. What I mean by enabling us is that we are irresponsible in our behavior and they bail us out every single time and become such a thing for us as a family that it's natural. Natural for them to bail us out every time. But the sad thing is this, that every time they bail us out, they take away our ability to take responsibility. And they love us so, so much that it's up to us as the people that are in care and are getting help. It's up to us to see that and say no thank you and start taking responsibility for your life. Because it will come to a place where there will be nothing left for you. I know of a person who was here a while back, finally ended up in separation with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the marriage. But uh, they spent over three million rand on rehabs, etc., etc. Where finally the other partner decided enough's enough. Enough's enough. The nice thing about that situation is that that person has started taking responsibility for her life. She, not, not completely on the up, but they're fighting up because there's no longer that ability to bail her out all the time. So she's starting to take responsibility. So what I'm trying to say is this 
And so we've got to come to a place where we as recovering addicts need to take responsibility for what we say, what we look at, what we do, and we must stop blaming things and situations around us. On top of the, se- on top of the section here, I wrote here, so, someone do it for me, I don't want to take the responsibility. There's two blocks to recovery in this one statement. Number one is blame shifting. We blame shift in those moments. It's because of this that this happened. It's because of this that this happened. We make excuses of why we cannot take responsibility. Let me tell you something now. My eight-year-old, my baby girl, can make excuses of pleasure, you know? But look around you. We don't have any excuses anymore. Yes, when we're this small, things happen to us that cause us to think certain ways. And we had no control over those things. Most of us in this room. But like I said, look around you. That time is gone. And what happens many times, we're stuck there. And because we're stuck there, we stay angry there. And we cannot move on from ourselves. Yeah, you heard me, from ourselves. And the only way we move on from ourselves is take responsibility. For you to start taking responsibility in life, you need to allow pressure. People that don't take responsibilities tend to run away from any form of pressure. Anything that doesn't go away, we want to leave. We want to walk away. There's no difference if you're in the center and you want to leave today or tomorrow or don't want to be anymore. There's no difference when you're out there. When something goes wrong, what do you do? You leave. You don't hang around. Get into a fight, big boom, bang, and gone. Now we come here and we go, now because this is wrong here and this is wrong here, it's a different situation. No, it's not. It's exactly the same person that refuses to take responsibility. You can't take responsibility on your terms. It's impossible. I will take responsibility only if this and this works like this. And we do that many times. We negotiate our responsibility. Imagine me, imagine me negotiating with my family and saying, look here, yeah, I'll be a good father to you if you do this and this and this. But we do that with our lives. We do that with our loved ones. We say that if you do this, then I'll take responsibility. If you don't do this, it's your fault that I don't take responsibility. We do that. 100%. That is why we're sitting in these chairs today. We're sitting in these chairs today because we refuse to take responsibility. But a nice statement there. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading today. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading today. And that's what we do every day, isn't it? We get hard the whole day. We'll start tomorrow. So we, we think we can escape responsibility. No, 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 no. The way we feel is our responsibility. The way we react to how we feel is our responsibility. Anything that comes out of us, it's our responsibility. No matter what's happening around us. And that's a tough, that's a bitter pill to swallow. It's a bitter pill to swallow. But you cannot take responsibility if you don't swallow that pill. You cannot. Absolutely impossible. Responsibility is often defined as our response to God's ability to be responsible. It's to respond to the opportunities that God has placed in front of us. Think about how many times have you had opportunities placed before you? Jobs, eh? maybe relationships. And because you refuse responsibility, for example, if you're in a relationship and you really like to enjoy the relationship, your partner says to you, please stop using. And you continue and you continue and you continue and continue. Then there's a big explosion and we don't take responsibility for it. Yeah, but this was wrong. Yes, but that was wrong. Man, you're going to do the same thing again and again and again and again, expecting a different result because you refuse to take responsibility. Be honest with yourself. None of us are here for good behavior. Not one of us, including myself standing up here. Amen. amen. And the person just said amen, or including him. <laughs> None of us are here for good behavior. None of us. So we're going to walk around like, as if we got it together. We're lying to ourselves. And if we're lying to ourselves, you cannot go to your next level in your life. You don't know who you are, man. I say to some of you guys, the reason I don't want to go back to that life is because I know what I'm capable of. Mm. And what I'm capable of is nasty. Very nasty. I used to be nice at first, eh? fun to be around, and I became very nasty. You don't want to talk to me. I was wondering why people would stay away from me. I get very angry with them. I mean, it's my fault. Not their fault. It's my fault. When you accept that, things start changing. And the funny thing about that is it doesn't change immediately. So we come here and we want things to change now. We leave here and we want things to be different now. We don't understand everything that we need in life, everything we need to get in life is a process. And I've mentioned this before in class, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for hope in the future. To prosper you. No? And the saying goes like this, is that 
God has a plan for every one of us Yeah, Every one of us. And His plan is a good plan. And everything turns out good in the end. See, the thing about Him, He doesn't tell you the process. <laughs> he doesn't tell you the in-between. But that's where faith comes in. If you truly believe that He's a plan and a purpose for your life, no matter what happens to you while you're here and while you're out there, you'll keep heading towards the goal. You'll keep, staying responsible. You'll keep staying responsible because you know and you trust Him enough. You don't lean on your understanding. You know that at the end of the day, you win. You win. The reason we keep falling all the time is because we doubt ourselves. We believe we're not going to win. It's impossible. I made a mistake. Oh, this person was nasty to me. How many times do you throw away a job because you're angry at the boss or angry at the person? How many times do you throw away an opportunity because you get angry and you get bitter about it? You throw away opportunity. But see, if your head space was in a different space and something came your way, you would realize, but wait a minute, this is not a nice situation. But things are going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. And I mentioned this before in preaching. Ephesians 3 verse 20. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that works within you. Nice scripture, eh? Who likes that scripture? Very powerful, eh? Very, very powerful. That scripture was written in prison, guys. It was written in prison. Paul was in prison when he wrote that scripture. There was no shaking of the jail. No angels led him out like he did with Peter and shaking the jail when he was Silas. He sat there writing. And he was able to, in that moment of time, to write a piece of scripture that we read still today that encourages us. <coughs> that tells me it's not because he was in denial about where he's at. He just knew at the end of the day that he had something to do in this lifetime and God had his back. Amen. God had his back. Let me tell you something. The reason we destroy ourselves is because we don't love ourselves. We don't love ourselves. So when you come in, you want to raise your hands, hallelujah, etc., etc., but you're destroying your life and your thinking's not right, you've got, to, you've got to question yourself, be honest. You know what? Maybe I don't really believe that he loves me that much. I read something the other day. I said when we, when we were very negative or down, one of the, like when you're worried or fearful. Anybody ever been fearful or worried about something? And it actually overwhelms you and it overtakes you. And one of the most simple things you can do to help yourselves come out of that is, one, ask him to show him how much he loves you. Or two, meditate on how much he loves you. Amen. Three, thank him for how much he loves you. Because when you get that revelation, no matter what situation you're in, it becomes like water of a duck's back. Every man of God in the Old Testament and New Testament, when they did great things in the name of God, was because they realized that God had their back. They realized that, understood it. When they were still not in their full calling, all the mighty men, when they were not in their full calling, it was because they didn't understand that God had their back. Moses is a very good example. Very, very good example. He knew that he was going to save his people. So he took it upon himself and he killed one of the Egyptians. Right? Mm. Then he came a while later and saw two of his kind fighting and he tried to stop them. And they said, are you going to murder me like you murdered the Egyptian? And he thought, oh no. They know. And out of fear he ran. And for 40 years he wandered in the desert. Obviously he got married and all these things. After 40 years, when there's nothing left of him, when, not, when he wasn't full of himself anymore, when he, when he realized that, hey, with Alim I'm nothing, he had a burning bush experience. Then, and even then, when he had the burning bush experience, his confidence was shot. Remember, you're stuttering. Eh? I can't go do it. I can't go talk. Can't do it. Then you can actually read in the Bible, it sounds like he almost got irritated with Moses. He said, okay, take your brother. But by the end of it, when Moses was leading him through, through, through the desert, where his confidence was back, but his confidence was completely reliant on God's ability. Like the first part of this book. Completely reliant. And every one of us here can have a burning bush experience. Every one of us. But it cannot happen if we hold on, hold on to our own understanding, our own way of thinking, and we allow the situations and circumstances to dictate us what the way forward is. Sometimes good decisions, well not sometimes, very good decisions are only made when times are tough. The enemy is very clever. He makes you think when things are going wrong that you're doing something wrong. Not necessarily. Maybe sometimes things are going wrong because he knows it's around the corner is your breakthrough. Because many times, I'm telling you now, many times when you've been doing well in life, you know that thing when you climb up and it feels like the carpet's been pulled underneath you? And you're down again and your parents are like, what's wrong with this guy? Eh? Then again, you climb up, you stop making a life yourself and, and the next minute, you're doing well. There's no issue, there's no problem, there's no breakup, everything's going good. And next minute, boom. Comes Monday, you realize I'm too hard to go to work. <laughs> eh? It's your belief system. It's how you see it. 
You're the only ones who can change it. <coughs> and understand something, there's things inside of us that want to destroy us. Self-destruct. Mm. And when you take responsibility, it's hard, isn't it? And when you first get here and you're already being into a tough time, it's very hard to make your bed. I remember coming here in 2011, first time I did dishes. I thought, wow, this took forever. This was really long. No, I really took strength. I thought, no, no, man. Imagine washing dishes like all the time. There wasn't many of us. I took strength with it. But when I accepted it, and I said, dishes became nothing. That's why I laugh at you guys when you say, I don't have enough people in the kitchen. There's only seven of us. We need more. No, 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 no. No, guys, you don't understand. We used to be four sometimes. The ladies have been four and they finished this quicker than me. You know what I mean? Because we refuse to take responsibility. We refuse to take responsibility because we don't like the way it feels. We cannot take responsibility with our feelings. Today, I feel I'm going to be responsible. Today, I feel I'm going to be responsible. Let me tell you something. You'll remain responsible for about an hour or so until something comes your way. You abdicate responsibility and then you start blaming everybody else of why you cannot be responsible. You don't understand. My counsel is a douche. Or you don't understand. Jericho is not what they say they are. You don't... But you don't understand if you keep doing that, you will never take responsibility. Never, ever, 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 ever. You'll be 50 and still complaining about the same things. And you're laughing because you're very young, but it's very really true. I've been here for a very long time, and I've seen people older than some of us here, a lot older, still acting like a child. And it started then, not now. I think there's one thing I want you to ask to understand. A lot of you guys aren't very old yet, or not at a certain age. A lot of your life ahead of you. No? They say 40 is a new 30. I wish. <laughs> wish my niece, I wish my niece told me the same thing. Don't, don't, don't be lied to you. You look in the mirror one moment, there's no gray hair. <coughs> Next moment you look in the mirror and you're in a, oof, I've got gray hair now. And what did I do last year? For many years of my life, I threw year after year away. Had a lot of fun, but I don't remember a lot of that fun. <laughs> Don't you remember a lot of it? With big memory gaps in a lot of my years. The next thing I know, I look at them. Okay? Not as quick as I used to be. Do you want that? <coughs> no, none of you want that. But it's not going to change because you don't want that. It's going to change. You start taking responsibility. It is fairly easy to be excited when God first speaks to us and gives us an opportunity to do something. Okay? Eh? You call for ministry, you call to be a prophet, you call to whatever, whatever, whatever excites you in your belief system. But like I said, it doesn't tell you the in between. I know that I'm called to be a doctor, eh? or a lawyer, or a, I don't know, name something that you wanted to be when you were a kid. And then when it comes to push and there's pressure, we go, no, 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 thank you. You guys have not, not achieved certain things because you are nobody. You're not achieved certain things because you refuse to go through the process. That's it. You refuse. And the process is for everybody. The process won't change because we don't like the process. Some people go to university and they study to be a doctor. They don't like the teachers. But guess what? They stick it out. And they get their degree. We're the type of guys that go to university and we don't like the teachers and we allow it to affect us so much that we leave or drop out of university. Because it's too hard. Because the teachers are ding on. We come to a center for help and we drop out because we don't like, I don't know. You name it. Think about it. But we think it's different. It's not different. See, we've got detail to everything. We've got detail for everything. This is okay, this is not okay. But God doesn't have detail. It's like this. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, pride of life. Those are the three temptations. He was tempted in all ways, but without sin. You're going like, yeah, but he didn't have this to contend with and this to contend with. Yeah, you're right. But that's our problem. We look at detail. This, so we go... We are not in the same space as him because we weren't staying in those days. We stay in these days, so for us it's a lot harder to go. No, 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 no. He tells you straight. Nothing new underneath the sun. Nothing. But we want to look at the detail of something. It's not okay to do this because we don't like the look of it. Oh, now it's okay to do it because we like the look of it. Most of, you, new, most of your ventures are exciting simply because they are new. Excitement will carry a person along for a while but it's not, it will not take him across the finish line. Man, Jimison College, you only speak about it. Wow, every year, exciting, exciting times. Hey, yes, I see, what was that shampoo called? Body on tap. Body on tap. Yeah. Uh, yes, I used to have hair to wash. Body on tap. Yes, 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 yes. 
And I remember, oh, I'll tell you a funny thing about that. I used to work in the one club, was one club I was working at. This lady walked past, but obviously I just, my head was shaved. And, and uh, I tapped the soft body on tap. She looked at me and goes, really? No. I said, I wasn't always bald. I kept going. <laughs> yeah. But I remember going into college. I'm going to make it happen. Okay. You know, almost, I think in the three years I went there again and again and again, I think it was only one year where I made it to the next day without making trouble. Okay. Every, f- every first day, you justify. There's not much, much going on. They're handing out books. You still get stoned. Okay. Okay, it's almost tomorrow either. We're handing out books. It's a stand. Then a week later, you realize, damn, I haven't got my books yet. <laughs> okay, it causes a bit of problems, eh? Personal responsibility cannot be delegated. Us as addicts, what we do is we, make, we hustle. We make plan. Eh? We, we abuse our rent. So, I oh, know, I'll phone mommy. I oh, know, I'll phone. Isn't it? Aren't you delegating your responsibility by doing that? <laughs> The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin and now I'll go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have sinned a great sin. It's quite funny that if you listen to it at one stage, God told it was his people when they were murmuring and then now Moses says it's your people. So you can, make, you can see how close they actually were. Eh? When you're fighting, you say, your son. Eh? No, no, it's my son. Oh, that's what's happening here. Your Your people. Yet now, if you forgive their sins, and if not, block me, I pray you out your book which you have written. Eh? Time to take on the responsibility of the people at the bottom. Eh? In my reading and study, I noticed that Israelites did not want to take responsibility, responsibility for anything. Moses did their praying. He sought God for them. He even did their repenting when they got themselves into trouble. I understand something with the people, the Israelites, that had the opportunity, but they were too afraid. They stopped themselves from going into the mountain. God didn't stop them. They stopped themselves. They said, now let Moses talk to him. They were too afraid. The condemnation and all the stuff that was in them. Moses was free to go there. And remember, there's one more person who used to follow him, Joshua. Read your book. Read your Bible. And it said, when Moses finished praying, Joshua was still praying. So Moses left the tent. Joshua stayed behind and prayed. Who went into the promised land? Joshua. Joshua went to the promised land. In my reading, well, a baby has no responsibility at all. That's me. You can't. I mean, look how naughty she is. And I realize, she's not being naughty, she's learning. No? She just look at things differently, then you'll see she's not actually naughty, she's learning. These are processes they're going through. You know, for example, they call them terrible twos. You know what actually happens to the terrible twos? It's not because they decide to become monsters or little brats. It's because they realize that two years old, they're, no longer, they're not actually part of the mother's body. They realize, oh, flip. I'm not actually part of this human being. I'm my own human being. Oh, I freaked me out. So they the best thing to do. No, they're like, oh, damn it. I'm, I'm my own person. Start talking, start moving around. That's what happens. So they freak out. And they say the best thing for you to do is to hug them. Hold them. Just hold them. Hold them tight. Give them comfort. Mike, all good. Time. In my reading and study, I noticed Israelites did not want to take responsibility for anything. Moses did the praying for them and, and, and. A baby has no responsibility at all, but as a child grows up, he's expected to take more and more responsibility. We get stuck. We get stuck. So tell me, where are you emotionally? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So what happens is we want to start taking responsibility. So we say, no, we want to change our lives. But we don't understand. We need to develop things we should have developed when we were younger. The good news is it develops a lot quicker if you take responsibility. If you won't take, so if you're at 13 still inside, it won't take you another seven, eight years to get there. But it will be very uncomfortable for you to get there. Because there's certain responsibilities you must take on that you take on at this age. But emotionally, you feel like you're not ready for it. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Maybe that's why sometimes we don't want to do what grown-ups do. Because maybe we don't feel grown-up inside. Because as a, t- as a teenager, you're supposed to find your identity. If you're at 30 and 40 or late 20s and you don't have your identity, that's something you should have developed when you were in high school. That's difficult, isn't it? Because you must be, almost be treated like a teenager, or you've got to go through teenagers' emotions just to develop that ability to know your identity. <coughs> the Lord gave me an opportunity to be, be in full-time ministry to teach His Word on national radio and television, to preach the gospel all over the United States and in other nations. But I can assure you that there is a responsibility side they can call many know nothing of. A lot of people say they want to be in ministry because they think it's a continual spiritual event. I like what she says here, because... I've been in ministry many times before this. And it's not just, ooh, 
It's not. There's some stuff where the rubber meets the road. There's some stuff you need to deal with and work with and go through. You, know, you see the guy on TV, you think this guy, no, 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 you don't understand there's battles there. There are battles there. When you see a CEO of a company, or th there was a battle there. There was a fight there. See, what successful people do what we refuse to do. Yes, some successful people are corrupt. Yes, I know that. Because that's what we do when we're negative. Eh? Yeah, but... No, no, no. There's some successful people that are far from corrupt. They worked hard to get where they got. What did they do? They took responsibility. Where were they at? See, we want to take responsibility when we leave. Isn't it? Yeah, I don't have to be okay. When I leave, I'll be okay. You take responsibility, yeah. Right now. Sitting here, you take responsibility for what you hear and what you take in and what you apply in your life. I cannot do that for you. You walk out of it and you go, okay, this is what I need to do. You know what you, know what you need to do. You know what you're procrastinating on. I don't know if you've ever seen that video clip with the Admiral. And he stands in front of all the people and he gives a speech, I think at a varsity or something. And he says, if you want to change the world, what's number one? Make your bed. Wow. Make your bed. And we go, like, oh. I don't have time to make my bed. I'm just going to do this and this. No, make your bed. Make your bed. Put it to the test when you leave. Put it to the test to make your bed. It's difficult. It is. You don't feel like making your bed. I'll do it just now. We don't realize that it's a difficult part that causes us to procrastinate. When we procrastinate, we believe that what we need to do now is difficult. There's a lot, a lot more depth to things that we speak about. Procrastination, not just procrastination. You can, you can dissect it, you can open it. It's because right now you feel if you do it now, it's too difficult. Let me leave it for tomorrow. It might, I might, it might feel easier for me to do. <laughs> eh? But you know, if you leave, like that, well, it's thing here. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading today. Guess what? Tomorrow's will be harder. And next day will be harder. Yeah. And next day will be harder. Never, it will never become impossible, even though your emotions or your mindset might tell you it will be impossible. Never be impossible. That's why they say the older you get, it's more difficult to change the way you think. Because you're more set in your ways. It never said it was impossible to change the way you think. It just said it's harder to change the way you think. The Bible says bend the reed while it's young. Because okay? sometimes when you bend something that's older, it snaps, it breaks. But the good news is that the healer is in our lives. And he speaks about that brokenness is a big part of your relationship with him. Again. When you come to the end of yourself. I'm going to go to the next. I'm just, going to, just, just bear with me. Of course, it is a privilege to work in ministry, but I try to make the point to new applicants that when the goose bumps and the excitement have subsided, they will find us expecting high levels of responsibility from them. I've had people come into the center. And I've got one person in mind, I remember, but it's happened a few times since then. How are you doing? No, fantastic. This place is awesome. I'm going to make it happen. And I normally smile at them. It sounds a bit pessimistic. I'll start speaking in two weeks' time. Because that's what happens. A new change, a new excitement. Yeah, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to get help I need. There's work to be done. Whatever you decide to do, there's work to be done. But when it starts getting difficult, we want to back down. Not realizing that that's exactly where you should be. When it starts getting difficult, you are in the perfect place. When it starts getting difficult, you start exercising that muscle that you refuse to exercise for most of your life. Heat and pressure is what brings change. When a person allows himself to be in the heat of what they're in, they change. What we like to, we like to move away a bit. I think all the change we need. People that do well in their grades are people that apply themselves. You can see the application as they put themselves on a drug, put themselves under pressure. We go, oh, I've studied enough, let me put down my books. Eh? I've trained enough, let me go and draw. Where they go, no, 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 let me train harder. All that is pressure. See, we think that pain is bad. Pain is not always bad. It's not about pain when you stick your hand in the fire and your hand goes, you're burning. Eh? And you say, no, it's fine. Ralph says it's not that bad. Keep, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when there's pain. When you're uncomfortable, that is not bad. Because that uncomfortable will develop your character. Character is not something you're born with. You're not born with your character. Oh, look at the character. Your personality develops. A lot of our behaviors is learned behavior. Character is something that you develop. You develop your character. And character is something if you go into a blacksmith and that, like fire, heat, and that. Ding, ding, ding. Now see yourself as that, and God is busy. Huh? So when times are tough, you can go, ooh, this is not of God. You can go, whoa, whoa, maybe, maybe this situation will be used for the greater good. This situation, not a bad situation, I'm talking about 
Man, the biggest thing we fight day by day is our emotions, our feelings. It's the biggest thing we fight. And the biggest thing we manipulate when we are full, uh, when are, when we are full addiction is our emotions. Think about it. When you started smoking weed for the first time, what were you? Bored. Mm-hmm. Bored. I was bored. How do you know you're bored? I felt bored. Why do you get jealous? Because you felt jealousy. Why do you get angry? Because you felt anger. So now you don't like the way you feel. You don't like what you think about yourself. So you take something and you go, wow, I felt sad just now, but now I'm happy and I'm laughing. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes. So remember the first time I took LSD? I laughed. Ass off. I laughed so much, and that's what I wanted again. So I pursued that thing too much that almost every second trip I had was a bad trip. You want to do to my brain? Huh? No wonder I had so much fear when I got older. Because you're pursuing that thing. Now you come here, and all those things you've been suppressing over time come back. And after six months, it's not enough to bring up all the things you need to, that you are feeling. Because I'll tell you something now, you're not in your old environment. You're going to go back to your old environment. Your brain's going to go, okay, in this environment, this is what I do to survive. And when that happens, that's when, you, that's when the fight takes place. Then when that happens, and if you can't overcome here, the chance to overcome there is far less. Anger, bitterness, resentment, being negative, all those things, is old ways of coping. That's why it's nice to get high when we feel like that. Because it makes us feel better, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So what happens is we're waiting for that feeling of resentment to change before we stop dragging. It's never going to change because you never you refuse to process it. You refuse to let it be pressed out of you. Refuse. Let's go to the ants, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no chief overseer or ruler provides her food in the summer and gathers her supplies in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O sluggard? When will you arise out of your sleep? Yet a little sleep, yet a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to lie down and sleep. So will your poverty come like a robber or one who travels with slowly but surely approaching steps and your want like an armed man making you helpless. Doesn't it sound like us when we're in full-blown addiction? The lazy mindset the Israelites has was one of the things that kept them in the wilderness 40, 40 years making an 11-day trip. Hey, 11-day trip, 40 years. No, 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 we would do. We'll complain. Go, what the? 11 day trip where it takes 40 years. Hey, instead of going, realizing it was our own faults that we took 40 years. No one else's fault. <coughs> I'm going to be something to your attention. Two things they complained about then, thousands of years ago. What were they complaining about? No water. Leadership and food. Leadership and food. Leadership and food. That's what they complain about. What do we complain about here when we're negative? <laughs> Extras. Leadership and food. Who gives you the extras? Leadership. Soup. Hmm. <laughs> exactly. What do we complain about? <laughs> many are called, few are chosen. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 20, 16. I once heard a Bible teacher say that this verse means that many are called or given an opportunity to do something for the Lord, but very few are willing to take the responsibility to answer their call. As I mentioned in the previous chapter, a lot of people have a wishbone, but no backbone. People with a wilderness mentality want to have everything and do nothing. Get up and go. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses the minister, Moses, my servant is dead, so now arise, take his place, go over the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land which I have given to you, the Israelites, every place upon which the sole of your foot you shall tread, so I'll be given to you. And that's the same promise he promised to Moses. Now let me tell you something now. In the first book of Joshua, first chapter, he says over and over again, be strong and courageous. Why were you telling Josh? Joshua was the one with Caleb that said, we can go, we can take it now. The other ten were the ones that turned the whole of Israel against Moses and said, no, we can't take it. We're too small in the eyes. We'll get killed. But these two guys said, no, let's go kick. Forty years later, this guy gets told by God, be strong and courageous. Because remember, he saw his own mentor, the person he looked up to, not going to the promised land. He wants Moses to do things that, man, when you read about it in Genesis, we think, was it really like that? Exodus, was it really like that? All the books, of it, was it really, did those things really happen? He was saying to be strong, very courageous, because his own self died. He had to face himself. Because he's about to do what Moses couldn't do. And guess what he did? 
He parted the waters of the Jordan. That quite did exactly what Moses did. Not in such a big scale, but big enough. I mean, how many of you parted the waters? Hmm. Let me put this down. He wants to be great here. He wants to do something with their lives. He wants to leave a legacy. Only half of you. Why not? You don't want to do. Huh? You do? Okay. So every one of you, I want to do, leave a legacy and be great. Huh? The price of greatness is what? Sacrifice. Responsibility. Sacrifice. Responsibility is the price for greatness. Every day, take responsibility. Every moment, take responsibility for what you think, what you do, what you talk about, your attitude. When you, take, when you have the man, does, break up the word. English language, or language in general, has lost a lot of its power. We say things flippantly. Huh? Love you. <laughs> just for the sake of getting it over and done with. Yeah. Hey? Are you okay? Yeah. Well, not, you. <laughs> not really interested in if he's okay. Oh. You say all these oh, words. Really? And those words are powerful. Yeah. They're very, very powerful. So here's responsibility. Split the word. Become a bit dyslexic. The ability to respond. Oh. Every one of us here have the ability to respond. Every one of us. Got to go back to the book for that last part. Because it says something very interesting in the last part, and I like it. Because it's something that I, you know, my guys and my counselees, I, I tackle that part a lot. I'm going to read the last. If you use wisdom, you will find God meeting, you, meeting your needs. Remember, wisdom is applied knowledge. Not knowing things. All of us know things here. But all of us are sitting in here with the things we know. <laughs> okay? So it's applied knowledge. Anyone operating in the mind of Christ will walk in wisdom. I like what this shit says. Anybody operating in Christ will walk in wisdom, will walk in responsibility, do what they need to do. And then she says, not emotions. Not emotions. You cannot be responsible with your emotions. Can not. Point blank. Authority is, another, is a synonym for responsibility. Control is another one. Power is another one. I like this one here. Leadership is another one. You go into leadership because you take responsibility. Don't you get selected as a monitor or a leader? They see that you're responsible. They see they don't like your... They don't, and when you, when you don't get what you want, they see that despite that, your responsibility doesn't lack anymore. You don't go backwards now because you don't get what you want. See, that's responsibility. Management. Duty. Wow, it's a big one, eh? Being responsible is your duty. It's like a minimum requirement to God to be responsible. What does he call his, what, is, what does disciples mean? His disciples. What does it mean? Disciplined ones. Direct. Yeah. Disciplined ones. So if you're disciplined, it means you're taking responsibility. And my favorite is influence. You know when God says he'll give you power? Yeah, many, in many places it means like, like power, power. But in many places it actually means I will give you power. I will give you influence. So if you want that influence that God has for you, to change the atmosphere, it comes hand in hand with responsibility. They hold hands. Otherwise they're separate. And you have no influence. You'll have no substance. You'll tell someone to, someone to do something and they'll just look at you. You'll try to help someone and they'll just look at you. Well, because, not because you don't have something in you to give, but you've never taken responsibility. Because you don't take responsibility for yourself. And you're always trying to make everybody else take responsibility. You lack memory. You can't make... To make everybody else take responsibility does make you responsible for a human being. A lot of us like to do that. We want everybody else to take responsibility for what they've done. But while we're doing that, we're unable to take responsibility for ourselves. It's very difficult. If you're walking around doing that the whole time and oh, making them take responsibility the whole time, you're using all your energy for something that you need for yourself. And you can only be the man you need to be when you use that energy on yourself. Not for selfish gain. To be the person that God's called you to be. To be the influence that God's called you to be. <coughs> so stop abdicating responsibility. Stop making excuses. You want to have authority? You want to be in leadership? You want to be in management? You want to do your duty? 
You want to have influence? Stop making excuses. Amen. Bye, close your eyes. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity you've given us. I thank you, Lord, that your word is strong in our lives, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that we are disciplined ones, Lord, that we are responsible in our behavior, and we will not make excuses. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.